Hello, everybody. I hope you're all having a great day. So far, um, did web development lose the right direction? And before I kick it off, um, I want to make sure here. So I'm wearing currently a JavaScript hat, which means that I'm a complete JavaScript fanboy. But what I wanted to do in the next 38 minutes is I want to talk about general best practices and who I am. Who am I actually? So I'm Stefan. I work for a company that is called Contentful. So we're one of these uh, API first content management providers. So if you're looking for a CMS for your React front end or Jamstack applications, you can check that out. And I actually uh, started doing web development around about 10 years ago. And I did, as a lot of people did, my first internship at an e-commerce company here in Berlin. And this was the tech stack that I was facing when I started doing web development. So it was MySQL and Apache Server and PHP. And when I started, I was studying computer science um, next to, to this internship. I was already super lost with this architecture. I was like, oh my God, what is happening here? And there were a lot of engineers around and they were just hacking in the terminal. And I was just like, oh my God, you will never learn that. So what we were doing is we, were, we had some functionality in the front end layer. So when you do front end for a little bit, you might know that prototype and jQuery basically solved the same problem 10 years ago. But we had both in our front end, just, I don't know, because more is always better, I guess. Everything was running with Magento. Um, so it was an e-commerce shop, uh, shop. And then slowly but surely, front end became more powerful. And I wrote my first backbone JS project, which was kind of one of the first single page application frameworks out there. And then people started um, evangelizing performance web, uh, web performance best practices. So what you see here is why slow, which was basically a collection of, this is how you do front end so that it's not slowing down your websites. And as probably a lot of developers, I started blogging because I wanted to be one of these person that rights to the world. So what you see here is my first blog. It was built in Jekyll and it was uh, myself and three colleagues um, being very ambitious. We all made it to one or two blog posts and then forgot about it. Uh, I assume a lot of people have the same problem there. But the front end journey didn't stop there. So I was doing my first backbone applications and then these kind of things appeared. So these are the uh, build tools Grunt and Gulp. And these were the first tool that moved the front end layer to the next level because front end build pipelines um, with these tools became more than just minifying and concatenating files. Front end developers from one year to the other built these complete tool chains that optimized everything and made everything way more complex. Then I switched a few companies. I did a little bit of Angular 1 which was an interesting experience. And of course, at the, on the side, I was doing more front-end related technologies and was learning more. And now after 10 years, this led me to wearing this JavaScript hat, right? I love technology and I love writing JavaScript. So I abandoned the blog that I started eight years ago with Jekyll and I um, built my own personal blog then. What you see here is a website that is built with a universal JavaScript framework cutting edge, and I was using that from 2017 to 2020. And man, I spent so much time tweaking and building and kind of adjusting this website. And if you care about a high quality website, you might be familiar with this tool. This is Google Chrome Lighthouse. And what you can do is you can open the dev tools and you can just say, hey, can you check my site? And it gives you some performance or some scores uh, about quality. So you see that at the time that I had a performance score of 90, um, an accessibility score of 100, best practices 93, and zero 100. Overall, everything is pretty green. If you're caring about web performance, you might also know this tool. So what you see there is web page test, which is one of these tools that you can use to do synthetic performance monitoring. And you see there that I had a speed index of roughly one second on a cable connection, which means that the majority of this website was visible after a second on a cable connection. And you see that even on a 3G connection, everything was there more or less after four seconds. When you're looking at Lighthouse scores, um, you have to be aware of that. Usually when you're above 90 in the performance score, you're in the top 5% of performing websites of this world. So overall, I felt pretty good about what I built there. 
And of course, it was following all these new great best practices that we do in the front end world today. It was everything was shipped with HTTP2, everything was compressed, minified. I shipped for uh, evergreen browsers, unpolyfilled JavaScript using the no module bridge. Of course, there was proper font handling in there. I was preloading everything. And of course, this is how JavaScript or front end applications look these days. Everything was uh, probably code splitted and optimized. And I thought that this was actually a piece of art and I was very proud of that. And then um, beginning of this year, this site was trending on Hacker News. So what you see here is a random website from Italy. Uh, it's not looking that fancy for 2020, but when you look at this, there's one thing that I want to point out. Oh my God, is this website snappy. And it is still maintained up to today, which I think is pretty cool. So when you look under the hood of this website, you first, first of all, you will see a bunch of uh, GIFs, right? And I totally should include these on my website too, because I think it has a nice retro touch. And it has this kind of old school HTML, which is probably not the best approach for today anymore. So what happens when you go to Lighthouse now and you check this website? You see that this website is outperforming my beautifully engineered uh, JavaScript, universal JavaScript website. And even the website that I built without knowing anything or without knowing much about web development was still outperforming what I spent hours on optimizing. So I couldn't believe that and I went back to web page tests. So web page tests also uh, allows this slash video route. So what you can do there is you can just paste in three URLs and you get a fancy video here. And it was actually true. My eight year old website was outperforming and this Italian website was also way faster or faster than what I spent so much time on. So you could now say, well, Stefan, you just messed it up. And honestly, I think that could be. But the question that I want to ask you is, how can it be so easy to mess up? And where's this difference actually coming from? So let's have a look under the hood here. So here we see the three websites. The overall page rate of my website is, first of all, way, way more. When we have a look at the index HTML, you will also see that I'm shipping 100 kilobyte in the index HTML file, and this is compressed stuff. And I will talk about that a little bit later. The CSS resources are more or less the same. The uh, JavaScript resources differ on big scale, right? 22 JavaScript resources for a static block. Uh, images resources don't really matter in this case. And all these combined then lead to this different experience and the lower speed index for my site, and then for this lower performance score. So how is the Lighthouse performance score actually calculated. So when you have a detailed look into this, you see that it's a combination of six metrics, and this changed uh, three or four months ago. It is the first contentful paint, which means when something meaningful enters the screen, then it's the time to interactive, which is basically when all the JavaScript is downloaded, parsed, and executed. Then it's the speed index, which gives you information on how fast the majority of the site is uh, painted and visible. Then there's the largest contentful paint, which is like the big chunks that come in. Then it's the total blocking time, which means that the browser is busy, busy uh, parsing and execute your JavaScript. And then it's cumulative layout shift, which basically measures how much of your layout jumps around while the page is loading. And we all know this kind of thing that you want to press a button and then the button just moves down and you press an add. This is exactly this uh, metric here. And when you have a detailed look at this, you see that there are two metrics that are 100% bound to JavaScript. Because JavaScript in the browser, so the browser is a single threaded environment, which means that when the browser is dealing with your JavaScript, everything else is mainly blocked. If you want to learn more about the speed index and what it takes to actually come from this 90 to a 91, maybe in the score, you can check out these two resources and look, can learn more about the speed index. So when I was talking already, I mentioned the uh, single threaded browser environment. This is the most frustrating experience for the user. We could now ship an initial experience in HTML or something, but depending on the network and the devices that our users um, uh, have, it can be extremely frustrating. And we all know these kind of things that we see something, we click something and nothing is happening. 
And that is just because JavaScript has to be downloaded, parsed, and executed. And users don't understand that when they click a button, that JavaScript has to be executed and parsed. They just don't get that. They assume that it's working. And when you have a look at all these frameworks there, you have to take into consideration that uh, especially low-end devices, not everybody has a Pixel 4 or a recent iPhone, it can take up to 20 seconds to just parse all the JavaScript that we ship down. Netflix uh, did a little experiment. So what they had was they had a, a sign-up form and they was, were building this with React. And they found out that when they dropped React and went with a vanilla implementation, which means basically normal um, JavaScript without a framework, that they can, could improve the time to interactive by 50%. And now let's just think about a sign-up form for a moment. What you need in there is probably a little bit of validation and something that maybe does an AJAX request or not. The question is if you really need a JavaScript framework for building something like this. And when you're shipping for the web, it's very important to remember that 150 kilobytes of an image is nothing compared to 150 kilobyte of compressed JavaScript. Page weight is not equal page weight. So let's have a look at my enormous index HTML file. So when I released my cutting edge website uh, in 2017, of course I tweeted it out because I hang out on Twitter quite a little bit. And a person on the internet then told me, Stefan, what the, is in your index file? So basically what I did in public is that I was explaining, hey, um, there's a lot of stuff in line. Um, it's following best practices and it's uh, actually still pretty, pretty fast and that doesn't matter much. So what I did there is that I basically had an argument and I tried to argue myself out of this because, and I said that it's great because it's fast, but actually that meant that it's still faster than the rest of the internet, which doesn't necessarily mean it's super fast. But actually what I did back then is that I had an argument about the tech stack and I was super into this over-engineered piece of art that I was building there. So what was in there? 340 kilobytes for an index file for roughly 400 words. So what was in there was something like this. So in case you're not familiar with universal JavaScript application, uh, when you render a JavaScript code or template code on the server side and you ship the same code to the client, the client JavaScript has to know what data was used to render this HTML. And what I did and uh, decided to do is that I preload, preloaded inline 22 articles in this file so that the navigation is super snappy when someone clicks a link. And I had an average session length of 1.1 pages per user session. And I did all that for better performance. And when you have a tech stack um, of 2020, um, you hear very often that making a very fast website is extremely hard. But I really want to question that a little bit. So my friend Phil Hawksworth uh, works for for Netlify, and he's one of the big advocates for the Jamstack, which usually deals with pre-generated HTML. And he has a lot of very, very fast websites out there. And people ask him, hey, how do you do this? And what he says is that basically, he's not adding anything that makes it slow. And the work is usually done before you even enter uh, the URL in your address bar. And I couldn't believe that, so I tried it out. So what you see here is a little side project of mine. Um, it's called tinyhelpers.dev. So I built a little collection online that kind of lists all these kind of online tools that you see once, and when you don't bookmark them, you will never ever find them again because they're not popping up in Google. So I started building this collection of tools that I, I use online, and I built it with a fairly new static site generator, which is called 11T. And I had a almost complete green performance score out of the box. And Zach Lead, who is maintaining 11T, is actually proud of that because 11T is a very pure tool. It is not adding anything by default that makes websites slow. So what Zach does is he has this 11T performance leaderboard online. And you see there that the median light out performance score for 11T sites is a very proud 100 because by default, 11T is not shipping or adding things that make a website slow. A few years ago, I was giving this talk and what I said on stage in Oslo uh, was that every website is a web app and every web app is a, is a website. 
And oh boy, now two years forward, I couldn't disagree more with past me. Because where is the user's benefit from such overhead? So let's talk about this new best practice, which is universal JavaScript app apps for content sites. I would argue that the majority of the apps and websites that we had out there are basically really just content. And when I started doing web development, we had HTML5 boilerplate, which was kind of a blueprint for stuff that you could clone and then you would build your stuff from there. So it included some meta elements and then usually two JavaScript files, which was a vendor or plugins files, and then the JavaScript that you included. Now over the time, this changed to something like this. We code split things, we have several bundles, and we have to include this data block to tell the, tell the JavaScript, hey, this was the data that was used to render this HTML. And overly, I'm super excited about this in theory because you can run the same code on the server and on the client. I think this is beautiful. But at the same time, this means that you run the same code on the server and on the client. When you're, when you're doing these kind of architectures, you have always to consider what happens when you maybe add heavy resources, when you're not reusing code, because it will automatically go into the client side and it will make it slower on the other end. And I want to question if this is really the best way for our users. A lot of people that use these kind of architectures sometimes say uh, or say that this architecture offers uh, open stores for progressive enhancement. So in case you're not familiar with the term progressive enhancement, the idea is that you ship a base functionality. Usually this is HTML. And a lot of people um, take the stairs as an example here, and then you enrich it, usually with JavaScript, to something more fancy. The idea here is that if the enhancement fails, it still works, right? Stairs become escalators, and if they're broken, you can still walk up the escalator. But if you walk around in this world, how often do you actually see something like this? Maybe this whole idea of stairs becoming escalators doesn't work after all. So let me show you an example of progressive enhancement in the wild. Years ago, I was building another resource collection because uh, this is what I do. I make lists of things in public. And what you see there is perf tooling today. What you have there is a search box. You can type something in. And this is basically all it does. And this works no matter what. So what happens here is that when you interact with a search box, it will update the results in real time. Then it will update the URL um, to reflect the state of the actual website. And then even if JavaScript errors out, fails, or is not loaded yet, you can still submit this form, um, and it will give you the same results. This is progressive enhancement in action. Because in one moment or the other, your JavaScript will fail. Because we have this big question mark, the big unknown, the network layer in the middle. And depending on your scale and what websites and products you're building, JavaScript will um, be missing at some point for a few users. And we always have to remember that it's just not true that nobody has non-JavaScript users. Because every user is a non-JavaScript user while they are downloading, parsing, and executing our JavaScript. And there are also other good examples out there. So for example, I hang out on GitHub every day. And when you have a look at what GitHub is doing is to pay, for example, to post a comment on an issue, their endpoint accepts an old school form submit and an Ajax submit. If the JavaScript is broken, this still works. And even the stuff, the links on top are old school HTML links. And I have to say that I'm very happy with GitHub's experience because a good site should just work. So speaking about progressive enhancement, what is the enhancement that we're actually bringing out and pushing out to the world? And let me show you one example. And uh, I'm picking a little bit on React. This is far away from being React specific, but I had to pick something here, right? So let's have a look at the reactjs.org documentation. What you see there is that I'm loading it with a 3G connection. So it takes a little bit to load, and then you can click around, and it feels fairly snappy when you navigate. So I think this is a good experience. So but let's now do the same thing with JavaScript disabled. So you see that it takes the same moment to load, and you can click around. And I really would argue that the experience here is pretty much the same. So why are we, where's the enhancement here? There's one difference in these two things. 
the JavaScript version is substantially more heavy than without JavaScript, without offering more functionality. And even after four navigations, it is still way, way heavier than the without JavaScript um, uh, version without offering anything else on top. And I really don't want to pick on any particular framework or developers because I'm guilty of that myself. I was just super into this and I love the idea of doing that. But does this architecture really improve user experience for content sites, for example? I'm really not that sure anymore. But I can be very sure that sometimes it is harming user experience. So what you see here is, uh, so I used to travel quite a little bit. So what you see in German is the SMS that I get from my mobile provider, for example, when I get out of an airplane in the Ukraine. So this is too small. So let's make just a little bit bigger. It's still German. So let me translate that. So what O2, my mobile provider, is telling me here, Stefan, you get six megabytes for two euros, but you have to use that in 24 hours. This is a joke. When we look at 2020, we see that the average website um, uh, page rate currently is two megabytes. And now think about this. Let's say that I want to uh, order a cab in a foreign country where I'm not speaking the language and I'm paying two euros for every two megabytes. And then I'm just lost. And the question is, what is that useful for to make it that heavy? And it's also kind of depending on where you're coming from in the world. So I'm from Germany. I think the mobile costs in Germany are fairly okayish. But also last year I was in Canada. And the mobile contracts in Canada are extremely expensive. Canadian people care about megabytes when they're surfing the internet. And what we do in 2020 is that we ship more and more and more data for pretty much the same experience. So maybe it is time for the question um, of uh, for the question if app frameworks are for apps after all. I mean, Facebook is building Facebook with React. Facebook is an incredibly complex application. And this is what they're using it for. And I'm one of the biggest fans of Gmail, uh, right? It's a Google product, but I think it's beautiful software. So when you have a look at Gmail, for example, Gmail by itself is five megabytes of compressed resources. And I think that's okay for an application in that scenario. The cool thing about Gmail, um, sometimes when I'm traveling with the, with the trains here in Germany, you can pretty much forget the Wi-Fi that you get in the trains. But Gmail offers also a low data version without much JavaScript. And that just works. And this is 25K. I think this is just beautiful when I'm sitting in the train. And when you look at the architectures that we have right now, once a year, there is this um, project that is called the Web Almanac. And they scan actually what is used and what is shipped uh, out there in the internet. And you still see there that jQuery is shipped on 85% of the websites out there. And even though in my little hipster front end JavaScript bubble, it always feels like everybody is Angular, Vue, React. Now everybody's doing Svelte uh, or whatever comes next. Actually, it's not that much of the internet. It just feels like these kind of things are very present today. The web is not as cutting edge as it seems. And when we're thinking about our users, boring at the end of the day is beautiful and it is fast. And when you're going with a JavaScript uh, application and you um, uh, do dynamic routing, you have a lot of power and a lot of benefits. The biggest downside of going with client-side routing in JavaScript is that, first of all, you have to re-implement an accessible navigation. This is what browsers are good by default. And a, a client-side navigation usually works that you update the URL and then you just replace something in the DOM. Then you have the first problem that you have to show a lot of spinners, right? Because this is how, how the web works today. Spinner here, spinner there, spinner here. But also when you think about people that maybe use assistive technologies like screen readers, they just don't get the information that something changed. These kind of architectures make it immediately inaccessible for people uh, with assistive technology. Um, the people from Gatsby um, did a little nice research about what it takes to make actually client-side navigation um, accessible. And you have to do two things. 
First of all, you have to provide a skip link in your document so that people can go to the main area of the document. But then you have to include your own little HTML element that is an area life region to tell assistive technology that something changed because otherwise it's completely unusable for these people. And client-side navigation in the first run, I think it was invented to do things like this to build beautiful experiences that go from one state to the other and that give, us, give you a smile because it just looks so cool. But how often do we actually see this? And it is actually possible. So what you see here is a prototype from Sarah Dresner. She's very active in the view ecosystem. And I would love to browse the web with stuff like that so that it is fun to go from one place to the other with nice transitions from A to B. But this is not what we're using client-side navigation for. We're just dumping and replacing the body all the time without much benefit for the user. And even Ryan Florence, one of the maintainers of React Router, once said that he believes that client-side routing is usually not preferred to give the best experience. And this person spent probably years maintaining a, a library that is very popular about this. There are also good experience out there though. So for example, when you go to the Vue.js documentation and you navigate there, you will see that the Vue.js docs are not using client set navigation. And I want to believe that they did that because they think that it's not necessarily the best experience. At the end of the day, a great site should just work. And I honestly believe that to build great sites for the internet today, that there is the need for knowing the foundation of the web, which is still HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And when we're building for the web, I think that we shouldn't have this discussion initially, what should we use, should it be, which framework should it be, where should we go from there? I think that the conversations that we should have should more like, be more like this. So I want to build a site, what should I do? It shouldn't be this answer, you should use framework X, you have to have a server side rendering strategy, it has to have a service worker because everything today has to work offline, right, for one reason or another, and it has to run in a serverless function on the edge. Maybe technology choices should be like everything in programming and have the answer, it depends. What do you want to do? A great site can be built with React, Vue, and Angular. But I think it's more important to discuss the question that, or the statement that a great site is accessible, fast, and secure. And due to the overload of technology that we have in the front end ecosystem right now, I, every now and then I hear the statement that, ah, oh, Stefan, it's just HTML, right? It's just a few tags here and there. HTML by itself defines over 100 elements. The input elements by itself has 22 types, and this is still evolving. So you may have heard of this new enter key hint attribute that allows you to control the submit button on, button on virtual keyboards. Chris Coyer, who maintains CSS Tricks, which is a massive blog on web development, wrote a 4,000 word article on links versus buttons. And then we have markup like this out there in the wild because it's just HTML and people don't know when to use a link or a button element. HTML by itself is not easy. And when you have a look at another project, for example, from uh, WebAIM, WebAIM stands for Web Accessibility in Mind and they also scan the internet and they look for accessibility um, problems. And you see that, that most of the detectable CS, uh, accessibility errors that we out, have out there are based on the misuse of HTML. And when you go deeper, you will find out that usually uh, websites that ship with the JavaScript frameworks do just a little bit worse than the website that go without a JavaScript framework. And this is not the fault of the JavaScript frameworks. It's just like that people cannot know everything. And the more complex it gets, something just falls off the wagon. So this is the WebAIM 1 million or WebAIM million report. So what they found last year was that the, the number of detectable uh, VCAC, which stands for Web uh, Content Accessibility Guidelines, errors uh, raised from 98% of websites have some accessibility issues. And overall, this, we're not in a very great shape there. But it's not only about accessibility. Every now and then we have also these kind of news popping up where one third party vendor is hacked 
and hundreds of sites mine cryptocurrency. And I think this is surprising because we have a safety net in web technology. What you see here is a content security policy header that allows you to make your websites more secure and to really nail down what is allowed to be loaded in my website. When you have something like this, it's substantially harder to, for a third person to mine cryptocurrency and load another JavaScript file. And when you have a look at another statistics, you will see that only 6% of the websites out there use CSP to make their website safer. And due to this JavaScript ecosystem that we have today, it's just a package here, package here, package here. It's super great because I can always just install an NPM package to solve a problem that I have. But at the same time, the amount of packages or pages that ship with some vulnerable JavaScript library is currently at 80%. Overall, I feel like that the web is losing quality. But hey, I mean, I'm a hipster JavaScript developer, right? At, at the end of the day, developers got more productive. And after doing JavaScript now for 10 years, it started all with Node and NPM, because this was when the front end developers got superpowers. And now, um, a few years in, I deployed my first Node.js server uh, on Heroku, which is one of uh, a hosting provider. Today, we have, uh, for example, Netlify and Vercel. Um, that are pretty big in the Jamstack and pre-generating HTML market. And the cool thing that we have now in 2020 is serverless functions. Oh my God, I'm so excited about serverless functions. So I can write some Node.js, but I still prefer to stay in the client side. And what serverless function is that I can deploy these six lines of JavaScript to a hosting provider and I can build my own APIs. And I think this is beautiful. The options to build a product today um, are basically limitless because there's a free to use service for everything. So there's something for analytics, there's some, something for content, something for databases, monitoring, search. I can just bootstrap a new product, project in a few days. But at the same time, the hello world from HTML5 boilerplate, um, maybe shipping with 10K, just became way, way bigger over the time. And I would be maybe also okay with this, but the hello world of today increased uncountable in complexity. So coming back to the side project that I did, um, the tiny helpers thing. So what you can do there is that you can clone the GitHub repository, you can run NPM install, and then you can have an NPM script, uh, NPM run helpers add or something to add a new helper if you have something around. And a person just reached out to me and was like, love the project, love it, bookmark is super cool. But the fact that I had to download 700 megabytes to add a JSON file to this project is just ridiculous. And I have to say that I agree. We all know this joke about the node modules folder, which is the heaviest thing in this world, right? So when we now compare this Italian website, I don't know the person who's maintaining that, right? No clue. But I bet that this is person uses a random text editor and FTPs the stuff up. For the website that I build, what do I need? I need a text editor, I need a reason, Node.js version, I need NPM version, I need framework knowledge. And then if I would leave this project alone for two years, I can praise to the gods and hope that when I run NPM start, that it still works. And if I'm unlucky, I can go into the dependency updating day or week, depending on how complex the project is. Josh Kamo once said that it's never been easier to build complex apps. And I 100% agree with this statement. I want to question though how many sites that we build have to be complex apps. And where are we going with this trend? So when I started in my internship, I started with this intimidating tech stack already. People that are doing web development or starting to do web development today are looking at the fundamentals, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, framework knowledge, then Webpack, Rollup, Parcel, or whatever bundler comes out tomorrow or today. And then we know, have to know all these hosting things. It feels like complexity is king. And what are we actually doing that for? So when I was building Tiny Helpers, um, I built it initially with um, Preact. And of course, I had it running in a serverless function, server-side Preact, client-side Preact. And all I needed actually, all the interactivity that I needed in the site was a menu, uh, a hamburger button that displays uh, a menu and toggles it. So I decided to drop everything. And Jason Miller, who is the maintainer of Preact, he came up with this idea that it would be cool if our built tool chains would at some point make the decision 
Yep. There's not enough functionality. Let's drop the framework and let's rewrite everything automatically for the best user experience. Because what I ended up doing at the end was 16 lines of JavaScript. This is all that is needed inside of the site and just works and it's way more maintainable and it's super lightweight. So maybe we will have good enough abstractions one day, but today I still believe that you have to know the fundamentals to create the best user experiences. And depending on the company that you're working in and working at, you really have to consider the technology choices that you make. Because if you and your company pick framework ABC today, you're shaping the job market of tomorrow. At Contentful, we picked Angular one uh, years ago. The engineering teams are working for months to migrating this. Technology choices affect the company's bottom line. But I really want to believe that my job as a web developer is to build beautiful experiences. But unfortunately, this is not really true in 2020 because my job is to decide and to know what tools to use, to decide what frameworks to use, to decide what to prioritize, and then to figure out what the best way to maintain a project over the long time. There's just a lot of things going on and people that maybe start uh, started a year or two years ago that start working in this environment, they are lacking the, um, the knowledge of the fundamentals and it's not their fault. Everything is just overly complex. Chris Coyer said that he was talking to a person that um, did, was doing front-end development for three years and after asking them to build a website, they didn't know how because they didn't know where to start. Because all these kind of buzzwords are just a lot of things to know. And when we think about the term of a front-end developer, for me, it feels like that we finally, finally should drop the term of a front-end developer. Because there are currently two camps in the front-end world. There are on the left side, the engineers that are into React, maybe GraphQL, maybe some Webpack, JavaScript performance. And then we have the other direction, which, care, which are people that care about HTML, care about usability, care about accessibility. Um, Maybe it's really time to recognize that the term front-end developer is not the best choice. Maybe we need JavaScript engineers and UX engineers to really fit the requirements of building for the web today. But the majority or the main thing that I really care, think is that at the end, it really doesn't matter because your users and visitors couldn't care less about your technical implementation. My mother doesn't care about the website if it's built with a React of you. What should matter the most is that we ship a good user experience. Currently though, I think that a lot of developers, and I was in that camp too, value developer experience more than the actually end user experience. So we're coming to an end of this long rant. So at the end, I'm wearing a JavaScript hat, right? I love writing shiny tools. I love writing JavaScript, but maybe it is time to take a step back and consider the best tools for the job to ship for the web. So where did that bring myself? So I was having this universal JavaScript app running in, in, in my little production for three years, and I just recently dropped it and I rebuilt it with a pure implementation. I dropped the overall page rate by 64%. So this website currently has roughly 400 pages um, and uh, 20,000 um, unique page views. The build time of uh, of this site dropped from four minutes to 40 seconds. I enjoy the reduced complexity so, so much because I don't have to deal with any big build chain. And if I need some custom JavaScript functionality, I'm using custom elements. Um, what you see there is a component that is provided by GitHub. It's called uh, time ago. You drop it in and it will do some tiny functionality where it makes sense. And now in 2020, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a member of this anti-JavaScript JavaScript club because I want to use it when it makes sense. And the most important thing because I opened with this is that now I have a complete green lighthouse score and I have a site with a better user experience. So, Stefan, is a JavaScript stack really, really that bad? I don't think at all that this is true. But I think that developers on front-end developers in 2020 should focus more on building sites that just work. And I think that we should worry less about the technology that we use to do that. 
If you want to have a look at these, at these slides, they are available on uh, my dash links online did release direction. And I have to point out that I own the domain my dash links online because I think I'm the troll of the internet. And uh, thank you everybody for, for listening. I'm Stefan 